Hello, my name is Caitlin Bache. I'm an assistant editor at ASHRAE Journal. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, part of the ASHRAE Journal Supplier Webinar Series. The series provides information to ASHRAE Journal readers and to others about products and technology of interest to industry professionals. ASHRAE does not review supplier webinar presentations. The following presentation has been prepared by Owens Corning. The subject is Design Considerations for District Energy Systems. Today's speakers are Alec Cusick and Mackenzie Mahalski. Alec is a technical services engineer for the industrial foam glass business at Owens Corning. Prior to his current role, he was in technical sales for fiberglass and mineral wool mechanical insulation with Owens Corning. He serves on multiple technical committees, including ASHRAE and the National Insulation Association. He holds a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Toledo. Mackenzie is a technical services engineer for the industrial foam glass business at Owens Corning, a graduate from the University of Toledo with a bachelor of science in mechanical engineering and minor in professional sales. She is a certified energy appraiser through the National Insulation Association and an ASTM committee member. Alec, the microphone is all yours. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Very excited to be here today, and thank you everyone else for joining. Uh, before we get started, I'm just going to take a little bit to set the agenda for what we'll be talking about here today. Uh, to get started, we'll just do a little overview about Owens Corning as a business for those that may not be familiar with us. We'll then move into some chilled water considerations that should be noted as a part of these district energy systems. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about nuances that go into types of systems that may go into vaults, tunnels, and direct buried systems. Uh, and towards the end, we'll talk about one unique solution that can be considered for these types of systems in cellular glass insulation. And we'll wrap things up at the end by talking about some technical services that Owens Corning offers as a business to the market. So just to kick things off, uh, to get started, Owens Corning is a global industrial and building materials leader with three integrated businesses dedicated to the manufacture and advancement of insulation, roofing, and fiberglass composite materials. We have over 20,000 employees that operate across 33 different countries around the globe, and we're very proud to have been a member of the Fortune 500 company list for 67 consecutive years. Owens Corning offers a wide portfolio of insulation products that can be utilized in many different areas within modern commercial buildings. Our product portfolio consists of both open and closed cell insulation solutions, including foam glass cellular glass, fiberglass, perock and thermofiber mineral wool, and foamular extruded polystyrene. So from here, we'll move right into our main topic for today, which is, of course, around district energy insulation systems. Uh, district energy systems are becoming more commonplace as practical HVAC solutions for environments that include multiple buildings, such as universities, hospitals, and some downtown urban areas. A typical system will consist of chilled water, as well as hot water or steam lines, to deliver heating and cooling to the various facilities within its network. Typically, the piping for these systems will either be housed within underground vaults or tunnels, or be directly buried in the ground. Each of these factors bring about different challenges when it comes to designing an effective insulation system, which is what we'll be talking about. So as we just mentioned, district energy systems will typically consist of both high temperature water or steam, as well as chilled water piping. Uh, due to their below ambient nature, chilled water lines do bring about some specific challenges when designing insulation systems around them. Here we're going to explore some of these challenges and how to best approach them. Now when we talk about chilled water systems, there's typically going to be a temperature range that we're referring to. This could be down towards 36 degrees Fahrenheit for your chilled water supply lines, all the way up to 50 or 55 degrees Fahrenheit for your chilled water return lines. If you've ever had a cold beverage sitting on a patio on a hot summer's day, you're already familiar with the phenomenon that we're going to be talking about today, and that is condensation and moisture buildup all along that cold pipe surface. 
This condensation can bring about a variety of challenges for the insulation system on that cold pipe. We're going to be talking today about strong vapor drive into and onto that cold pipe surface underneath the insulation, and that will bring about an emphasis on the performance of the insulation system's vapor barrier. If that vapor barrier were to become compromised, the system would be subject to failure and could bring about a variety of issues. These issues could become immediately apparent, or in some cases, they may remain hidden for months or even years, waiting to be discovered down the road. One consequence of excessive condensation taking place within your insulation involves the loss of that insulation's efficiency. If the wrong insulation material is chosen, it actually can absorb and retain any moisture from the condensation that's occurring. It's widely known in the industry that insulation becomes much less effective when it's allowed to become saturated with water. This can lead to thermal bridging, allowing more heat gain back into your chilled water supply lines, which will lead to energy losses and increased costs, requiring more energy to cool these pipes back down to that 40 degree operating temperature. This will also lead to a loss of process control. Warmer supply lines will lead to a diminished cooling effect in the commercial building as a whole. And this also puts extra strain on your equipment, putting added stress on the chillers in order to reduce the temperature of the water back down to the operating temperature that it needs to be. Another byproduct of introducing moisture underneath your insulation system involves the potential for corrosion under insulation, or CUI, to occur. Some key ingredients for the corrosion of carbon steel include the presence of oxygen as well as liquid moisture. Oxygen is almost always readily available, whether it be from the air or dissolved in water itself. So once condensation takes place and liquid moisture becomes readily available, you do become at risk for corrosion to begin occurring. Corrosion can damage the outside of the pipes over the span of multiple years, and in the most catastrophic instances, can result in the failure of the entire piping system in general. Now that we've identified some common issues associated with chilled water insulation, let's talk about some key considerations that can be made during the design phase of your system. So I'd like to start off just by covering some key terminology that we'll be discussing. Uh, humidity is the concentration of water vapor present in any given airspace. Relative humidity is a percentage ratio that compares the actual amount of moisture in the air versus the amounts that it could hold at a given temperature. Vapor pressure is the pressure at which water, both liquid and vapor, will exist in equilibrium at a given temperature under atmospheric conditions. And finally, the dew point is the temperature at which condensation will begin and is a product of both temperature and relative humidity. When air cools to its dew point through contact with a surface that is colder than the air, water will condense onto said surface. One can view the topic of vapor pressure similar to that of normal pressure, and that is vapor will tend to move from areas of high pressure to low vapor pressure. You can think of it as vapor moving from warmer to cold air, or in this case, towards the cold surface of a chilled water pipe. And this is the phenomenon commonly referred to as vapor drive in the industry. An insulation system with a compromised vapor barrier can allow this moisture in the air to move towards that cold pipe where it can then condense into liquid moisture. This insulation system can become compromised due to initial poor installation, or damage that can happen after the fact, whether that be from maintenance activities or typical pedestrian traffic that happens to be in the area. So when determining the right insulation material for your chilled water system, one property that you may want to consider is the permeability of that insulation material. Permeability is the tendency of a material to allow liquids or gases to pass through it. Permeable insulations rely solely on the performance of an external vapor barrier to keep water vapor out of the system. If that vapor barrier becomes compromised, permeable insulations can allow water vapor to move towards the cold pipe where it may condense along the surface. This condensed water can then be absorbed and retained into the insulation, which can compromise the K value, leading to lower external surface temperatures on your insulation and you end up with a situation where you not only have condensation taking place on the chilled water pipe, 
but also potentially on the external facing of the insulation itself. As you can see on the right, closed cell insulations typically tend to have much lower water vapor permeability values than open cell and granular types of insulation. I mentioned it briefly just there, but surface temperature of your insulation actually does play a pivotal role in proper condensation control. Proper insulation thickness is necessary to prevent surface condensation or sweating from occurring. Our goal should always be to ensure that the insulation surface temperature is greater than the surrounding air's dew point. Because you can see we have a below uh, an example of a chilled water pipe of around 40 degrees Fahrenheit with ambient air of 80 degrees and a relative humidity of 75%. And this gives us a dew point of around 71.3 degrees F. In this example, we make sure to use enough insulation thickness to achieve a surface temperature of 74 degrees, safely preventing surface condensation from occurring on our insulation. One thing I would like to mention is that even in this scenario, there does exist a point within the insulation thickness where the temperature falls to the dew point. However, as long as the system's vapor barrier remains in contact, uh, intact, or if a zero permeability insulation is used, the water vapor itself will not be able to penetrate the insulation to the point where it can freely condense. So within the industry, there do exist many different standards from different organizations to help aid in the design of commercial insulation systems. One such standard that's commonly looked at is ASHRAE 90.1, the energy standard for buildings except for low-rise residential buildings. This standard can be very useful and is commonly referenced in determining thickness requirements for chilled water lines. However, I would like to note that this standard is built around energy conservation, not specifically for condensation control. In reality, necessary insulation thicknesses should be calculated for each set of parameters and ambient conditions that's unique to your specific system. Another piece to consider when designing your chilled water system is the geographic location of your project. Different parts of the country will be subject to different temperatures and relative humidities, resulting in different vapor pressures. Here we have a rough illustration of the annual mean maximum dew point temperatures that various parts of the country typically experience. Condensation becomes a critical concern and a more likely problem to encounter in high humidity environments where there exists a much higher vapor drive from ambient air towards a cold pipe surface. As a quick note, I'd like to point out that this map shows the average max dew point, but does not showcase extreme conditions that individual locations may experience. Yet another design consideration of your insulation system that should not be ignored involves the emissivity of the outermost jacketing to be used. Emissivity is the relative effectiveness of a surface to emit and absorb heat by radiation. It's expressed as a ratio between zero and one and is most relevant in this scenario to the outermost jacketing to be used on an insulation system. The higher the emissivity, the more heat transfer will occur between the material and its environment via electromagnetic radiation. When considering chilled water pipes in warm environments, low emissivity jacketing materials, such as aluminum and steel, will absorb less heat from their surroundings via radiation which will result in a lower jacketing surface temperature. Conversely, high emissivity jacketing materials, such as PVC and ASJ, will absorb more heat from their surroundings, yielding an overall higher surface temperature for the same system. Here we can look at an example as exactly how this effect comes into play in our design considerations. In this example, we have two 8-inch chilled water pipes operating at 40 degrees F, each insulated with an unnamed type X insulation. There's no wind, and the ambient air is 90 degrees F with 80% relative humidity, giving us a dew point of around 83 degrees. When covering our insulation with brand new aluminum jacketing, the surface temperature we get is 81.9 degrees. This is less than the dew point of the surrounding ambient air, and this becomes an immediate concern for surface condensation on the jacketing to take place. However, if we take the same system and cover it with PVC jacketing, more heat from the environment is allowed to transfer into the jacketing surface, 
giving us a surface temperature of 86.7 degrees, safely above the dew point where surface condensation would become an issue. At this point, I'd like to hand the mic over to Kenzie, and she'll take it up from here to discuss some underground considerations to be made. Thanks, Alex. So just an FYI for all the attendees on here, as we're going through this presentation, please use that Q&A box to ask any questions, and we will be getting to those at the end of this webinar. So as he mentioned earlier in this presentation, um, district energy systems transport resources typically underground. We're going to take a deeper dive into the different types of environments and conditions that these process lines are going to be exposed to, starting with vaults and tunnels. I just want to preface, when designing any system, it's good practice to determine the potential worst case scenarios and design accordingly. Um, so the size of these tunnels containing hot and cold processes processes will vary depending on the scale of the overall HVAC system. They're going to range from large enough to have multiple people be able to walk through them to small enough to be a crawl space. Either way, maintenance workers are eventually at some point going to be within them doing any maintenance. So an insulation system with adequate compressive strength can better withstand damage from any foot traffic or negative impacts associated with the maintenance workers. Additionally, depending on the tunnel's location and access points, there could be potential for vermin to find their way in. So a durable and inorganic insulation is going to help detour any burrowing activities and from acting as a food source. Another challenge with underground tunnels um, involves the risk of flooding to happen. It's quite common for tunnels to experience flooding at some point within their lifespan. Um, if flooding does occur, your insulation system can be submerged in underwater for extended periods of time. If a permeable or absorbent insulation material is used, water can penetrate that system through any openings in the vapor barrier and then saturate the insulation and compromise the thermal resistance of the system. Some pump systems can help to mitigate this risk, but they can also be subject to clogging and failure. So essentially to combat this, non-absorbing insulation materials are often preferred. Um, they will resist absorbing of water in the event of a flood. And it's equally as important um, to use the properly insulation accessories to ensure the integrity of all the joints and penetrations of that system. So continuing off of that example, let's just say that there's a high pressure steam line that has permeable insulation um, and it has become saturated due to flooding. There may be times where steam in these piping systems is going to be cycled on and off and not directly in use, and they can sit idle while retaining that water in the insulation. Once that steam line resumes operation, it can quickly raise the temperature of any water that's in contact with it. In the worst of cases, this can cause rapid boil off um, to occur within that insulation and the resulting steam pressure can then force the insulation off of the pipe from the inside out and completely compromising the system's insulating value. So a compromised insulation system can lead to a variety of other issues. This includes increased energy costs as well as loss in process control and the efficiency of the heating and cooling that the buildings is going to have with that system. In the case of insulation failures on steam lines, it can lead to a dramatic increase in ambient temperatures, so the surrounding air, within the tunnel themselves, um, as heat from the piping is freely able to escape into the tunnel. Considering how chilled water lines often share the same space as these steam lines, this can then compound the issue. Alec also mentioned earlier how water vapor will drive from warm air to cold surfaces. So if the ambient air within a tunnel is dramatically raised due to the escaping heat from that steam line, this is then going to increase the vapor drive from the warm air onto the insulation of the chilled water line. 
In the case of permeable insulations, any compromise of the system's vapor barrier will allow for water vapor to freely condense on the chilled pipe surface and within the adjacent insulation. This is just another potential cause for failure of the system's insulation and results in the previously mentioned issues. And finally, in some cases, the same tunnels that contain those steam lines may also serve to carry internet and electrical cables from building to building. If that ambient temperature of the space climbs high enough due to insulation failure on steam piping, it could then compromise the plastic casing on any wiring that's present, causing further complications that could result in costly maintenance. So now that we've discussed the challenges associated with underground tunnel environments, let's now consider the same for district energy systems that are direct buried. So an immediate challenge with direct buried systems um, involves the forces of different loads that the piping and insulation are going to be subject to. First, we have soil load, which reverse, refers to the direct weight exerted on a pipe from the above soil backfill that you see on the photo on the right. This increases with soil density as well as burial depth. And then second, we have live load, which refers to the weight transferred to the pipe from heavy or moving objects from the above ground surface. This could be in the form of a stationary load, such as a building, or a dynamic load, such as vehicles on a road. Um, live load will be greater as the weight and movement of any objects above increases. It's also going to increase as the pipe outer diameter increases and in areas of shallow burial depths. In any case, the combined loads um, that are going to be on the piping and insulation system uh, should be considered, and an insulation material with sufficient enough compressive strength to withstand these loads should be specified. Next, we have hydrostatic pressure um, within ground soil that should also be considered. Hydrostatic pressure is the pressure exerted by a fluid at equilibrium at a given point within the fluid due to the force of gravity. This is going to be a big factor in areas where there are high water tables and in areas that experience high levels of precipitation throughout the seasons. Hydrostatic pressure increases as the soil depth increases. This pressure can drive water into insulation systems through any gaps or breaches of the system's moisture barrier, especially at those joints and protrusions. In the case of absorbent insulations, it can then seep in and saturate the insulation material, compromising thermal performance. And then in these areas, a closed cell and non-absorbent insulation material should be considered in order to mitigate the risk of insulation failure due to moisture ingress. And then we have thermal expansion as another critical cons consideration. So on high temperature processes, metal pipes will expand and lengthen as they are put into operation. Large stretches, stretches of piping during this expansion will need adequate space for accommodation. So let's say, for example, we have 100 lineal feet of carbon steel piping that is brought into service from 70 degrees Fahrenheit to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That pipe is then going to expand a total of 2.6 inches. Insulation systems that go on this piping should be designed in a way to allow this expansion to occur without damaging the joints between segments of the insulation. Thus, it is equally as important to have the proper design of expansion loops and Zs as it is the compatibility of insulation materials used to expand and contract with the system. So on this slide, you'll see an example of an expansion loop that's being installed for an underground system, along with a detailed drawing on how that insulation system may be installed to accommodate for that expansion that's going to take place. In this example, you can see the use of support pads and oversized insulation segments. This is going to allow the expanding metal piping freedom of movement without compromising or crushing the insulation itself. Details like you see on the left of this slide are typically pretty project specific, but they're going to help to ensure that a properly installed insulation system is going to happen in critical locations like these. 
So soil itself is not an efficient insulator. On direct buried systems, if the insulation were to fail or if no insulation is used, energy efficiency will be lost and heat is going to be able to travel freely to and from the piping system and its surroundings. Piping from one process often intersects or runs parallel to another process line within the soil, like you see in this photo. In high temperature steam lines, when they're uninsulated, heat can transfer to these adjacent lines, and if that line is carrying chilled water, it could raise its temperature and negatively impact the performance of your HVAC system. In more severe instances, this heat could be significant enough to damage or melt neighboring PVC lines as well as the casing of electrical wiring. Damage that could lead to excavation for repair. Unplanned maintenance on direct buried lines can be quite costly, especially if it happens underneath something like a road. This just further emphasizes the importance of a properly insulated selection design and insulation beforehand. So we've covered a lot of information, but all in all, there are multiple factors that go into designing a successful insulation system for district energy applications. As a recap, when designing your system, you're going to want to always determine the worst case conditions of your environment and plan accordingly. This includes the max temperature and relative humidity to be expected, as well as any indoor or outdoor complications that may be applicable. You'll want to be sure to calculate the thickness necessary to prevent surface condensation, taking into account the em emissivity of the jacketing that's going to be used. And finally, be sure to allocate adequate spacing between and around pipes for the insulation to be installed. And then when selecting an insulation material for a high-risk environment, consider a material that is closed cell and non-absorbent with a low to zero water vapor perm. It should be durable enough to tolerate its environment and have a compressive strength to withstand any weight that will come to rest against it, especially for direct buried and pipe support applications. And then finally, proper insulation and inspection is always important. Um, it should be carried out during construction to ensure the system is properly installed and sealed against moisture intrusion. So with all of that taken into consideration, I'd like to now take a moment to discuss one solution in particular that may be considered for district energy insulation systems, and that is cellular glass insulation, a zero perm approach. So just what is cellular glass insulation? Cellular glass insulation is a lightweight, rigid material composed of millions of completely sealed glass cells. Its closed cell structure and inorganic nature lend to unique properties amongst insulation materials. Foam glass is completely impermeable with a water vapor perm rating of zero. It does not require the use of an external vapor barrier to achieve this because the insulation itself acts as its own vapor barrier. It also has a relatively high compressive strength when compared to other insulation materials in this industry, making it very suitable for direct buried and pipe support applications. It's also very dimensionally stable, having a thermal expansion coefficient similar to that of carbon steel, making it suitable for a wide temperature cycling application. Being 100% inorganic and made of glass, foam glass is non-combustible and it does not give off dangerous gases in the event of a fire, making it very suitable for fire protection and fire stop applications. It is also resistant to the nesting activities of common vermin that may be found in an area and it is chemically resistant similar to many typical glass beakers. Finally, it's easy to cut and can be prefabricated to any different shape, size, or configurations prior to arriving on the job site. Back to you, Alex. Thank you very much, Kenzie. Uh, so now just to wrap some things up, I'd like to offer some technical services that we as Owens Corning do offer to the market for those that want to pair with us to use our various insulation systems. So starting off, we maintain over 125 different commercial and industrial insulation system guide specifications. Uh, these are used as a guide for engineers, specifiers, contractors, and facility owners to aid in the design, installation, and maintenance activities around these various insulation systems. Uh, they include the products used, various detail drawings, and installation guidelines accordingly. 
And we're also more than happy to help review client specifications and help provide advice as to how you could improve your own specs should you, should you need some insight on that. Here's an example of one of our detailed drawings that we offer specifically for our chilled water system. Uh, we generate drawings like these regularly to help bridge the gap between specification and field installation and to increase the confidence level that proper application techniques are being utilized on site while it's being installed. We maintain and utilize a full suite of proprietary thermal calculation softwares that also helps aid in the design for those who specify our insulation. If you have questions as to what insulation thickness or jacketing material to use in order to achieve a certain surface temperature, if you're curious about cost savings potential, or just have general questions about process control, we'd be happy to assist with a thermal calculation report tailored to your specific system. We also provide on-site support around process improvement and energy savings. Uh, we have multiple certified thermographers on staff, myself included, and we can arrive on various job sites to perform infrared inspection surveys and conduct heat flow measurement and analysis. We can then issue a current insulation condition report, evaluate energy losses and savings potential, and provide advice on insulation system improvements to consider. And finally, we are seen as an industry leader in education, training, and startup support. We hold frequent training sessions that allow us to build relationships with our customers through shared experiences. These allow engineers and specifiers to become more familiar with our systems and allow contractors to better understand how to effectively install them in the field. Uh, we cover a variety of topics, including multiple different types of insulation systems, if your organization is specific to hot insulation systems, chilled water, or anything like uh, CUI mitigation, feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to help put together a program that can benefit you and your team uh, around the insulation systems that best apply to you. And with that, I'd like to once again thank you everyone who was able to join us today. Uh, myself and Kenzie's email addresses can be seen listed there. Feel free to reach out to either of us with any questions that you may have. Uh, you can also reach out to our technical services and training team. Uh, our phone number and email, once again, can be found uh, there. So at this point, I think we'd like to open it up for a Q&A portion. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A chat box if you haven't done so yet. And I'm going to be introducing Bethany Witts uh, from Owens Corning to help moderate some of the questions that have come in so far. Bethany? Absolutely, we do have a few, so we'll get started. First question, does Owens Corning have any anti-sweat coatings for locations where insulation may be difficult to install? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, great question. So we do not manufacture coatings that are specifically made for that purpose. Uh, obviously, many people have seen situations in the field where not enough room has been left for the insulation and it's been kind of left as an afterthought. Those are always particularly challenging. Your options in that scenario could be to paint a metallic surface to, again, increase that surface emissivity. That would make the temperature difference from surface to ambient air less extreme, which might help with dew points. But in all honesty, the lack of insulation on any sort of chilled water line is going to be a challenge. So getting creative with facility owners as well as manufacturers like us, we'd be happy to help work with if there's a certain way to fabricate insulation that, so that it can accommodate certain specific geometries. Um, I'd say in that instance, uh, probably best to take a one-off approach with both the facility owner as well as the manufacturer of, uh, like us to help try to get a custom insulation solution that could help you because a coating in of itself might not be enough to prevent sweating from taking place. Great, next question. Can pipe anchors be covered applications, best practices, et cetera? Okay, great, it's another good question. Uh, so anything that comes into the category of uh, a protrusion, something that's uh, attached to or coming out of a pipe, uh, especially in below ambient cases and even above ambient cases where temperatures are extreme enough, you kind of want to consider those as extensions of the main pipe that 
kind of need to be insulated to a certain degree by themselves. These fall under the category of thermal calculations that we frequently help our clients with. So depending on the application process temperature and the specific geometries of a pipe support that could be coming out of the pipe, uh, it may be an instance where you'd want to consider having a certain length of insulation that actually extends along that protrusion to prevent that protrusion from being too cold and allowing surface condensation to take place. Um, so obviously it's very nuanced. You'll have to look at what that specific pipe support looks like. Uh, but in general, protrusion should be uh, insulated to a certain extent to prevent surface condensation in the same way that you'd be looking at the insulation on your main body piping. Great. Uh, next question. Earlier you were talking about emissicity. The example you used mentioned zero wind speed. I'm curious how often wind plays a part when considering what insulation needs to be used. Excellent question. And yes, uh, in that specific example, I use the wind speed of zero because that actually does in uh, chilled water environments. That's oftentimes the most extreme case uh, and the harshest one to try to uh, raise the surface temperature because again in a chilled water scenario your goal is to get the surface temperature of the insulation above the dew point. The more wind speed you have the more rapidly the ambient air is going to raise that insulation surface to a greater temperature. So we basically did that assuming worst case conditions if there's no wind speed here's going to be the surface temperature of that insulation. Obviously, that's going to depend on where your system is. If we're talking about an indoor chilled water line at a hospital or an airport, wind speed's not going to be a factor at all. Uh, you could be dealing with chilled water structures of piping that go outside at an airport in which wind speed would definitely be a factor. You could also be looking at uh, any sort of uh, area where you have a transition from indoor to outdoor. So it really does depend on where that specific pipe would be located and that's kind of what we offer in terms of our technical services we'd be asking questions like that where's this pipe located is it indoors is it outdoors what's the climate like of your facility to get an idea as to the relative humidity it's going to be exposed to um, so there's no solid answer it's going to depend on the location but those are the types of questions that we would be asking if we were involved in a thermal calculation for you great i got a couple more how brief or detailed is the calculation support? What kind of details are needed from the project to support calculation support? Okay, so we have kind of have questions feeding into each other at this point. Mm -hmm. But yes, so uh, as, as I just kind of alluded to, anything that deals with the climates that will dictate what the dew point of your insulation system is, is going to be pivotal for us to know. Uh, if you let us know that you've got a 10 inch chilled water pipe, uh, at 40 degrees F um, and you don't tell us where it is, probably one of the first questions we would ask is, okay, are you in Houston, Texas? Are you in uh, Sioux City, South Dakota? Because those will be the types of things that will determine what the uh, expected temperature, relative humidity, dew points, and by extension vapor drive that that pipe's going to be exposed to. Um, and those are the types of questions that will allow us to build a thermal calculation report to let you know at various types of insulation thickness, here's going to be your surface temperature. And we can do so with multiple examples of jacketing. We can show you what the system would look like if you had a uh, aluminum jacketing over the top, which is very common. Uh, we can also show you what it would be like with a PVC jacketing. And those are the types of reports that can help uh, the specifier determine if there needs to be changes made. Either I need to increase my insulation thickness so that I don't have surface condensation taking place, or potentially if I don't need the mechanical abuse resistance, I can switch from a metal jacketing to something like PVC or ASJ because that's also a factor that can make getting your surface temperature above the dew point that much easier. A few more. Wouldn't the joints between individual sections of foam glass point for water point for water vapor to enter cold systems? Uh, yes, so great points, uh, very astute question. So the, the answer to that is yes. Uh, foam glass itself is a zero permeability insulation, and uh, it's very widely used in below ambient deplications because the insulation itself does not allow water vapor to pass through it. That being said, 
just like any other rigid fabricated insulation, you are going to be concerned about the points where adjacent sections of foam glass come together because where two sections of foam glass meet, you do have that, you know, area where their interface is that water vapor can pass through them. And that is why we partner with our uh, partner distributors and fabricators in North America, not only to help them fabricate foam glass so that it's always tightly fitting and properly fitted to various surfaces of geometry, but they also stock uh, a host of our suite of accessories that's to be used alongside foam glass. So depending on the specific application temperature that you have, we have a host of different sealants, for example, that's meant to be used alongside our foam glass. And the whole training program that I mentioned earlier, a lot of that involves applications just like that. How do you best apply sealants between sections of foam glass? How do you achieve that full depth of sealant? How do you bring two adjacent sections of foam glass together with the sealant intact throughout the interface so that you're right, that joint between sections of foam glass is not going to be considered a fail point for water vapor to get in. So in short, uh, the answer would be yes, and that's why we have a full suite of accessories to be used uh, alongside our foam glass to tackle problematic areas like that. I think we have time for one more, maybe. What factors would or should determine what types of jacketing should be used on a system? Great. Uh, another good question about jacketing. Getting a lot of emissivity questions here, which is good. That's a lot of the stuff that we assist the market with. So that comes down to, you know, where your system is going to be and the types of uh, external activities your insulation system is going to be exposed to. A lot of the times in internal chilled water scenarios, you know, if your chilled water piping is up in the ceiling and away from any common maintenance activities, uh, it's very common to see either an ASJ or a PVC jacketing being used because the higher surface emissivity of an opaque ASJ jacket makes it a little bit easier to avoid condensation from taking place on the surface or sweating to occur. However, in many scenarios, if it's an outdoor facility or if it's in a crowded room where you're going to have maintenance workers in and out of a lot, uh, a specifier may opt for a metal approach, aluminum or steel. In those cases, it could be a little more challenging to prevent surface condensation from taking place. You have a couple options. You could see if it's possible to go the route of painting uh, a metal jacketing. That will actually increase the emissivity uh, and benefit you in that regard. Or if not, you know, through our calculations that we can do, we can basically recommend, okay, you might want to add another half inch of insulation here to prevent, to make sure you're good from surface condensation taking place. So it's kind of a trade-off of if you need the mechanical resistance that a metal jacketing brings to the table, um, and if not, if that would make, make ASJ or PVC a suitable jacketing for your environment. All right, so I think uh, that will wrap up the Q&A that we tackled today. I think I see another couple questions that came through. We'll be sure to follow up with any questions that didn't get answered right now offline, so feel free to check your inbox and we'll be reaching out to individuals. But once again, I do want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us here today. Uh, our, our contact info can still be found on the screen. If there's any questions that come up after this, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to help you out with any insulation questions that you may have. And thank you very much, and we'll hope, hope you all have a great rest of the day.